Okay, everyone, we're gonna get started now. I uh, want to introduce our one of our first of four guest speakers over the course of today's events. Uh, Bob Bussell, a professor from LERC, which is the Labor Education Research Center at the University of Oregon, which is my understanding was founded the same year as GTFF, one year before. So this is also this is their 41st anniversary, which is which is a. Uh, no less auspicious. Uh, so Bob is the director of LERC. Uh, LERC has been a phenomenal supporter of GTFF over the years, and I, I like to think vice versa. Uh, LERC not only does research on labor issue, lab, labor issues, labor history, labor social science, uh, everything else. Uh, they also do help uh, community groups and activist organizations like GTFF do the work that we need to do uh, in order to organize and create collective power. Uh, as one small example, they were also a supporter of today's event, so thank Thank you for that. Uh, we appreciate it. Uh, so a little bit more about Bob. Uh, Bob, again, he's a, he's a labor historian. He's a historian, uh, particularly of, of labor, but he also has a long storied career before that. Uh, four decades working in the union movement, including with the United Farm Workers, 10 years as an organizer with the Amalgamated Clothing and Textile Workers Union. I love that name. Everything should be an amalgamated union, I think. Uh, and then he was a professor at Penn State and then later came to the University of Oregon. He's published numerous articles on labor history and contemporary labor issues in both academic and popular publications. I think something that characterizes a lot of academics uh, who come out of unions is that they try to engage with the public and not just the ivory tower of the academy. Uh, his most recent book is titled Fighting for Total Person Unionism, Harold Gibbons, Ernest Calloway, and Working Class Citizenship, which was published by University of Illinois Press in 2015. So Bob, thank you for being here. Uh, come on up. Thanks very much, Mike, uh, for that you know, kind introduction. And uh, it's really uh, wonderful to be here with you all today and to uh, help you celebrate your 40th anniversary. So happy 40th anniversary, GTFF. Um, yeah, as uh, Mike noted, you know, uh, Lurk in the GTFF, I think we have enjoyed a long and I think uh, wonderful relationship. Uh, we were founded in 1977. GTFF a year later, formal recognition. So I think we've had these parallel paths, but also, also often intersecting in terms of working together and supporting each other over the years. I certainly have great respect for GTFF's uh, achievements and its role on campus and in our larger union movement. And I will also say that when I'm working out in the rec center, I love seeing people with the Red Star t-shirt. <laughs> kind of coincides with some of the t-shirts I like to wear in the gym. Um, I also want to know, Dave Cecil I don't think is here, but another part of our relationship, one day, many, quite a few years ago, Dave gives me a call and says, you're going to get a call from some dean of the graduate school, because we kind of got, like in football, if there's an offside play and you get a free play and you can do whatever you want to do, Dave kind of got a free play in negotiations, so we got a graduate student. We've always had graduate employees or graduate uh, researchers, but we got one that basically is free. For t and Dave said, for time immemorial, he negotiated this. It was one of the best phone calls I've ever gotten. Uh, you know, it was truly in the best sense of win-win. Uh, so uh, I think an anniversary is really a good occasion both to look back and celebrate uh, and acknowledge achievement. And it's also a good opportunity to look forward, look ahead, to see what uh, the future might look like or to think about that a little bit. And so that's what I wanted to do with you today. And as Mike mentioned, I'm going to bring a few angles of vision to this task. One is, uh, as a historian, I've been a historian for Oh gosh, I guess 30 years at this point and have done academic and popular writing, so I'm going to bring that uh, lens to the task. And as Mike mentioned, I've been involved in one form or another. I call it, call it my 40 years lover's quarrel with the union movement. Uh, I've been involved with unions both as a staffer and for the last 25 as a labor educator, university-based. And also I was involved in graduate student organizing uh, back in the mid-80s and early 90s when I was in graduate school. And so I do have one prop that I brought this is a newsletter from our graduate uh, um, organizing committee. We were really lucky. We had a provost whose name was Robert Barker. <laughs> so some of you may know Bob Barker, game show host, you know, truth or consequences. So this was truth or consequences. Anyway, it, it was a gift from heaven. 
And, and one thing I've always appreciated about grad unions is the inventiveness, the fun, which our union movement could use more of that I think grad unions often bring to the task. So what I want to do is briefly look back with some historical context about the evolution of grad unionism and some of the themes that emerged from that. And then I want to think about um, challenges and opportunities in the historical moment that we're currently living in. And let me just say, I approach this with a considerable amount of humility. I, I don't know exactly what the right strategy or tactics for the union movement is. I have some ideas uh, and I'll share them, but I'm kind of in the thousand flowers blooming uh, in terms of the union movement and trying multiple types of strategies and tactics. And I'll share some of those with you, but I think it's important to recognize the need for experimentation and flexibility given the level of challenge we face and the gravity of this historical moment. But before we do that, I want to do a little bit of a prologue about another event in 1978, the year of the GTFF's founding, which I think can help ground our discussion. And I remember this fairly well from being around. There may be some of you as well. But there was a major attempt in 1978 to reform the nation's labor law. It was called labor law reform. So as you may know, right, the Wagner Act, the National Labor Relations Act, is what governs private sector labor relations. It was passed in 1935, upheld by the Supreme Court in 1937. The Wagner Act worked at least reasonably well in terms of protecting the rights of workers to organize, at least for a period of time after its inception. But it didn't take employers long to figure out there were a lot of loopholes in that law. And certainly, as you know, it was amended in 1947 with Taft-Hartley. Uh, it was amended another time in 1959, Landrum Griffin. Neither was in terms of strengthening the law. It was all about weakening it. So by the 1970s and well before that, you know, in private private sector union organizing drives employers would fire people. I was a union organizer in the 70s and 80s, and I encountered that all the time in the private sector. You would fire, management would fire workers. Uh, the penalties weren't that strong. If you fired somebody, it took a long time to get them back to work. The penalties weren't that severe. Management would delay elections. They would uh, delay first contract negotiations. I know you've not had much experience with that type of stuff here, but, but, but certainly, you know, it was a big problem in the private sector. You Unions would win elections, they couldn't negotiate contracts. And so really private sector labor law was pretty well broken at that point. So what was interesting was the union movement really tried a full court press in 1977 and 78 to amend that law. And the idea was that you would have provisions for faster elections, stronger penalties. Uh, there was a provision that if employers engaged in egregious union busting with contracts, that uh, they would be barred from getting federal contracts for a period of time. So it was really a full court press in terms of trying to change the nation's labor law. Not surprisingly, this act was filibustered, you know, by um, Southern Democrats and uh, Republicans for a, a large part. But here's what I think was particularly interesting, and I'll pose it to you as a question. There were a number of votes for cloture to try to bring the law to the floor. And on one of the votes, I'm going to ask at, at its peak, how many Republicans do you think actually were prepared to invoke cloture and let this law go, go get to pass? How many Republicans? May anyone guess? Zero? 14. In 1978, now that's not to say they would have voted for it had it gotten to the floor, but there were 14 Republicans. There were Republicans from New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, Vermont, Illinois, Maryland, and the two senators from Oregon, Republicans, Bob Packwood and Mark Hatfield, both voted you know, for cloture. And so just to say now, how many Republicans do you think would in the U.S. Senate? <laughs> yeah, now there we go. I'd say, you know, zero, right? And so it suggests this light year, I mean, this real sea change that we've had politically in the country. Uh, and I think it has implications certainly for us today because one of the trends in graduate student organizing has been private universities. You know, organizing graduate students at private universities and, of course, shifting labor board rulings sometimes say grads are eligible and sometimes say that they're not. But we have lived with the inability to change this labor law for quite some time. And again, as I mentioned, think about it. The Wagner Act, National Labor Relations Act, has only been amended twice in its history. 
in 83 years, neither time in labor's favor. So this is a law that's broken, and we have not been able to amend it in labor's favor. We've been a lot more effective with broad legislation that benefits workers in the uh, working class and middle class, but not specific legislation, at least federally, benefiting us. So I just offer this as a prologue, as a reminder of the daunting political context that we face, and uh, also, I would say, our ability to move forward in a hostile environment. So I will just close this prologue out by saying that if I were to think of a soundtrack for our union movement, I would call it Against All Odds. Uh, would be a good soundtrack, because in spite of all of that, we persevere and we succeed. But again, it's a difficult context in which we operate. So let me talk a little bit about some historical background in terms of grad student organizing and public sector union organizing, just to create a little bit of a context here. So as, uh, as I, I think at this count, it looks to me like there's approximately 35 graduate student unions in the country that uh, represent over 60,000 grad students uh, that actually have official representation rights in a number of other places where bargaining is underway. They're mostly at public universities, which is perhaps not surprising and we'll talk about this in a second. Uh, right now, I believe NYU is a private university that has grad unions, and very recently, Brandeis and Tufts have negotiated contracts. I don't know what it is about Massachusetts, uh, but there's just, you know, the, the, the Massachusetts miracle, there's a lot of grad organizing going on there and at other places. Uh, the first graduate student union, as you may know, was in Wisconsin in 1969. And at some level, I think this makes sense because Wisconsin was the first state to have state collective bargaining law for uh, folks, uh, you know, for public sector workers. It was a hotbed, certainly, of uh, all kinds of political and union activism. And uh, certainly was ironic, right, that Scott Walker, of blessed memory, um, <laughs> I don't know about you, but at our election party, that was a lot of war whoops when uh, we found out that he lost, perhaps not surprised, and kind of incidentally to the, maybe not coincidentally, to the uh, state superintendent of education. Um, but just again, that Wisconsin would be in the vanguard of, uh, you know, wreaking havoc on public sector workers and public sector bargaining rights. Uh, but Wisconsin was where this movement started, and the union here was the fourth uh, in, in the nation. And briefly to say, I think a lot of the activity with grad student unions was in the public sector, and that's uh, just in terms of public sector unionism. You know, there was a great uh, expansion of government after World War II, you had the GI Bill, you had federal aid to education, you had the need, for, you had the baby boom, some of us were part of that. Uh, you know, you just had more people, you needed more government and public services. Uh, so the expansion of schools, school personnel, and various types of government agencies. I think you also have to factor in the influence of social movements in the 1960s, that there were many people who were active in the civil rights and the women's and the anti-war movements, and eventually you have to well, well, some people are full-time activists, other folks, you know, you do have to find jobs so that you can still be an activist and pay your bills. So a lot of these folks found their way into educational institutions and I think provided an impetus for this type of organizing. Uh, and certainly we should, in terms of thinking of anniversaries, we should just certainly note that this is the 50th uh, anniversary of the Memphis uh, sanitation workers strike. And so the fight for racial justice. And I would just say, if you haven't read some of Dr. King's speeches from that time, they're really well worth reading in terms of the intersection of race and class, his really taking on capitalism in some fundamental ways. It's not the sanitized Dr. King of the dream that we so often hear about, it's another Dr. King, I think more of the real Dr. King, but worth noting in terms of public sector unionism and putting that front and center. And I should also add that I think in terms of public sector organizing, education unions and teachers were really very much at the forefront of that. You know, you got to re recall, right, that there were lots of private sector workers that were in unions at that time and teachers who were doing work uh, at all levels, but particularly K through 12 are saying, gee, our salaries are woeful. You know, there are people that hadn't had wages and in, you know, increases in years. And there was unpaid time for preparation, for extracurricular activities, no breaks, arbitrary treatment. And so what you begin to see in the late 60s and 70s is a lot of teachers taking direct action. You know, getting out in the streets. There's tons of teacher union strikes, work passages, work stoppages. And that really forced, and again, it's that old 
uh, the old way in which social change occurs, pressure from below creates enabling legislation from above. And of course, I think for, you know, just as it was with the Wagner Act in the 1930s, let's take stuff out of the streets and put it in the suites, so to speak, you know, in terms of actually having a structure by which people can bargain. And then there was also the spectacle of teachers in handcuffs. I mean, you had a number of teachers that were engaged in activity, you know, contempt of court. And you met some of those teachers when I came up in the union movement in Newark, New Jersey. I mean, they were real heroes and heroines that actually served jail time for contempt to get those bargaining rights. Uh, and all of that helped tip the scale along with the election of a number of Democratic governors in the late 60s and 70s. So by 1972, there are 26 states in the union that have public sector collective bargaining. Oregon followed a year later with our Public Employee Collective Bargaining Act, the PECPA, yeah, in uh, 1973. And the GTFF here was, the again, the fourth uh, grad union in the country in the vanguard of that. And as people noted before it, earlier at session, it took two strike votes, right, to finally prod the U of O to agree to a contract. And, you know, the issues I think of we, people have talked about, but again, I think graduate student unionism has always been founded, like most unionism, in things that affect people very directly where they work. So there were issues like wages and workloads and criteria for appointment and reappointment, grievance procedures. And what's impressed me with the GTFF is, I think, in terms of bargaining, it seems like over the years, not seems, it is, you've added bricks to the house almost every time out. You know, for lots of unions, collective bargaining has been, there's been concession bargaining, there's bricks being taken off the house. You've been putting bricks on the house, safety and health, contracting out limitations, your health and welfare trust, which I note is union administered. And that's kind of a throwback in our union movement. If you think back to the social unionism of the 19 teens and 20s, where unions began to do housing, co you know, cooperative housing, their own uh, health and welfare trust, showing what the working class could do by administering its own funds. You've been very much in that tradition as well. And of course, I have to say the epic strike in 2014, which I think people have referred to, but you can't refer to it enough. God, that was fun. <laughs> You know, uh, just to say, again, I'm not trying to be strike happy, well, maybe a little bit, uh, but, but just to say you think about, particularly in the post-air you know, post traffic controllers world, the strike and really almost losing that as a weapon or a tool of the union movement, the fact that you w waged an effective strike, that you built solidarity uh, both within your ranks and with other uh, unions, you know, taking on a major issue, medical and parental leave and winning creation of the hardship fund. And I would also note, right, this was the first strike in the GTFF's history, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's always interesting how I think the argument against graduate unions, I call it the civilization will fall argument. Oh, if you have a grad student union, go to hell in a handbasket. They're going to be striking, adversarial, dot, 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 dot. First strike in your, in, in, your, in your history, but an effective one. So I think you've had a really proud and solid record of achievement. I also want to salute that you've been actively engaged with AFT Oregon, your parent union. I see people from over the years, 16 years I've been here, people from the GTFF actively involved with our labor council when there are picket lines out here or their solidarity with other unions. So I just want to salute you because I think under difficult circumstances, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in a second, you've really built a union culture. And not only built a union culture, but you've passed it on. And that, that's a real achievement. So I really wanted to salute you for that. Um, so let's talk a little bit for a few seconds, a, a few minutes, just about the context for graduate student organizing more generally. Um, and I think, you know, we certainly have to look at, right, uh, the graduate student unions have grown in large part because particularly at public universities, there's been decreased funding, disinvestment in higher education, student financial aid, a host of policies we might call neoliberalism in terms of elevating the private market, uh, low tax policies, so it has led public universities, and this is a story you know we're familiar with here as well as other places, that we've had to rely much more on private funding. Universities have felt the need to become more entrepreneurial and enter into relationships uh, for corporate funded research. And so the universities were presented with a, real, with a problem, and one of the ways they've dealt with that in terms of lowering labor cost is to rely much more on uh, adjuncts, uh, graduate employees and teachers uh, to do 
re teaching research, basically the work of the university. So just, I'm, not, I'm only gonna use a few statistics in this talk, but I think these are important enough to use. So if you just think about the numbers, in 1975, 57% of university faculty were tenured or tenure track. That was down to 30% by 2011. Uh, the casualization of labor and really the indispensability of graduate labor. You know, that slogan, it was one we used when I was in grad school, and I know you all have used it too, that the uh, university works because we do. Yeah. No, it absolutely is the case. More recent data from the Economic Policy Institute uh, from between 2005 and 2015, tenure track faculty growth 4.8%, non-tenure track faculty 21.5%, grad employees, 16.7%. And I think too that the composition of graduate students has changed some over the years as well. My, that's, this is my impression, is that graduate students tend to be older than they might have been maybe 30 or 40 years ago, that people don't necessarily go right from college into graduate school, that they're out in the world, they're doing work. There are more people that have partners, they have families, they have additional obligations. The job market certainly is difficult. I remember when I was in graduate school 30 years ago, everyone said, there are gonna be a lot of faculty retiring and there's gonna to be tons of jobs. Yeah, <laughs> heard that one, yeah. Tons of jobs available. And I remember going out on the job market and boy, if you didn't have a book in hand, <laughs> You know, you weren't even going to be considered. I mean, in history, there were, you know, there were sometimes three, two, three hundred people going for each job. I mean, it was, I'm, I'm sorry, that's, yeah. <laughs> just, just saying, it was, it was, you know, in, you know, pretty tough in terms of this retrenchment and this kind of pot of gold at the end of the rainbow in terms of the tenure track job seemed like a will of the wisp for lots of folks. And so there are lots of folks that ended up kind of going on the contingent faculty adjunct, you know, train. Uh, debt, childcare, you know, we've talked about that some at the rally yesterday, major issues for graduate students. I think it's interesting too that there's been a remarkable consistency in the arguments of universities against graduate student unions. Uh, I'll just give that a nod. Uh, but um, there's always, I think, been a strong element of elitism in it, um, <laughs> which, which I just find noteworthy. But first, you know, to say graduate students are not employees or workers, they're apprentices. You know, you're, you're in training. So you're not employees, you're not eligible, and that's often the argument that they make legally, it's the argument they make to the public, it's the argument they make to students. Then there's all these fears, and again, I put them in the civilization will crumble category. Uh, you won't have collegiality. Graduate student unionism is incompatible with collegiality, with mentoring relationships, with the community of scholars. It's gonna be adversarial. It'll hurt academic freedom. Uh, I remember a prominent faculty member at this university who shall go unnamed during our faculty union drive who said publicly in a meeting, and I, my blood pressure I think shot up to 180 when I heard it, was that, um, yeah, unions are good for people that put bumpers on cars, I support that, but you know, not for university faculty. So it's a pink collar or a blue collar thing, but it's not a white collar thing. And I think that's been a pretty consistent argument. There's a kind of elitism and condescension that goes with this. As a former Yale Law School dean once said in that long fight that Yale has been having about unions for what, 30 plus years, uh, quote, the spirit of unionism, the spirit of the collective seemed foreign. And I think, you know, and again, I think that's what a number of university faculty believe both about graduate students as well as about university faculty. And I recall just in my own graduate experience, I remember having a meeting with the dean of our graduate school, nice person and all, but she called us her kids. And, you know, I mean, my parents could call me their kid, but I was... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I was 35 years old. I mean, I was the world's oldest kid, you know. We didn't like that so much. These strong elements of paternalism, I think, in all of this. I remember our uh, provost, Bob Barker, Robert Barker, excuse me, Robert Barker, but I remember in one of the sessions we had with him, he was very quick to say, this, this is not a bargaining session. And that was great to hear just because you, you saw how much they hated the idea that they would have to sit down with students as equals and actually bargain with them. So I think it's instructive that university administrations in many cases remain so adamant in their opposition to grad student unions. And I think at root it's just the same thing that it is for union opposition almost anywhere that the money really, you know, they can deal with the money ultimately. It's the power. 
It's the status. It's the sense that they would somehow be sullied by being involved in dealing with unions, which they think are for blue and pink rather than white collar workers. And so I think that's really it. You know, just this sense of giving up power, authority. They went through certain experiences and hazing, as it were. They want everyone else to go through that also. So that's really the argument I think we most often confront in the academy, because there's a long record of grad student unions, faculty unions, universities have thrived, have done well. It's not been an issue. Um, I also think thematically that the threat of direct action, whether it's strikes or work stoppages, both the threat and the reality of that has been a constant theme in graduate student organizing. It's often taken that as a level of threat to actually move university administrations. Certainly at NYU, you know, that was a piece of it. Uh, I also think that tactical inventiveness and strategic inventiveness has been very important for university grad student union struggles as well. Because a lot of times these are long, you know, it's a long game. These things take a lot of time and they go from cohorts of graduate students through other cohorts. And so there's threats of direct action. That's been a piece of it. It's union affiliation and getting that power. That's a piece of it. Also, I think sometimes grad student unions have been able to use existing committees. You know, the university, of course, loves to say, well, let's form a committee. Let's study this. We value your input. You know, all these sorts of things that at one level are co-optive co or co-optative, but at the same time, just as unions back in the 30s used company unions and employee representation plans and participated in them and got concrete concessions that showed the power of the union, but also said, look it, we can only go so far with this type of structure. I think graduate students have creatively used those types of structures to point out hypocrisy and contradiction. And at UW, University of Washington, I think that was part of their history and their long efforts to get a union. Uh, also mobilizing other allies, uh, other unions on your campus and elsewhere, elected officials, community, I think more broadly, that type of broad support, because these are tough institutions to crack. I think we continually struggle. Where's the, we know where the power is. How do we get countervailing power to get what we want? That's a continual issue. And I think graduate students have become more thoughtful and more sophisticated in thinking about those things over time. Um, I would also just say that some of these struggles are really long. I mean, at Yale, they're what in their 30 plus years on that. I mean, my colleague Gordon Lafer, I think, was involved in that 20 years ago. They're still fighting. Uh, Cornell University, where I went to graduate school, I wish we could say there's a union there. We were doing it in the mid 80s, and we still, don't, there was a representation election with a lot of, uh, um, what's the right word? Well, law breaking on the part of the university, that's the right word, and still don't have a union there. But the struggle continues. That's what I think is so impressive. So let me say, just in terms of the current terrain, if you look at grad student unionism, um, from the 1960s through the 1980s, there were seven uh, universities where grads organized. There were nine in the 1990s, uh, 15 between 2000 and 2010. And from 2010 on up, there are four that I can count and considerable organizing that's going on now. Let's take our hat off to our, our brothers and sisters and cousins at Portland State, as well as uh, other private universities. So, you know, the, so really, it, it's really heating up, I think, because I think increasingly as people look at just the cost, you know, what it costs to be housed, what it costs to get through school, what it costs for childcare and your family, and particularly, I think, in some of these cities in the Northeast, but in other places as well, you know, the, the balloon just can't take any more air. It's really prompting people to organize. And, you know, the Obama board, and so here's the other part you bring in the labor board for private universities, and as we see, depending generally, generally the Democratic administrations, when they appoint the labor board, they're more friendly, relatively speaking, to labor rights, and Republican administrations not, so we get these oscillating labor board decisions, favorable in terms of grad organizing and unfavorable. The Obama board in 2016 ruled on a Columbia University organizing petition that grads were employees. This prompted a flood of uh, petitions. So there are unions like SEIU, AFT, AAUP, uh, and um, UAW that have been the primary unions doing this organizing. And there's a boatload of private universities right now, as you may know, where there's organizing going on. University of Chicago, Yale, Harvard, Georgetown, Tufts, the New School, Boston College, uh, Brown, Brandeis, uh, University of Seattle, six union of postdocs just happened. 
you know, so uh, Portland stayed again on our home turf. But more recently, there were a number of petitions that were withdrawn a few months ago because of fear now that the Trump board, and he's getting an, an appointee that will shift the, uh, the, the balance of power, that they will rule unfavorably on these petitions. And so there's a concern that if you, so several unions had petitions for elections, withdrew them because they were concerned about getting an unfavorable ruling, uh, again, that would say that grad employees at private universities didn't have the right to organize. But with all of that, you know, we still have two victories recently, Tufts and Brandeis, Harvard's negotiating, and others at private universities. So the momentum, I think, really is, uh, shall we say, on our side. And uh, just to say it's interesting, just in terms of some of the recent contracts, uh, at Tufts, they got 12 to 19 percent raises over a four-year period and 12 weeks of paid parental leave. Um, at Brandeis, they got up to 50% in raises for some uh, workers over three years and expanded professional development opportunities. So I think the issues in many cases, you know, do remain these basic bread and butter workplace issues. But as we'll see, I think that there are other things that grad unions fight for and I would suggest should fight for that are broader in terms of the public good that are an important part of this equation as well. So let me, uh, that's kind of a historical overview and where we are now. I wanna offer at least a few, and let me emphasize these are reflections, suggestions, not prescriptions, but just in terms of as we think ahead and look at the future, let me just share a few thoughts and I would you know, love to have a conversation with you about them or, or anything else. Uh, I think as we look forward, I think that education unions will play a critical role in any resurgence of our union movement. I mean, they already have, right? Starting with the Chicago teachers lighting that spark, what, five years ago, four years ago? Uh, the schools our students deserve. What an inspirational strike. A lot of this is in K through 12. But let's right, think about education as a key equalizing institution. We think about inequality, educational opportunity, educational access has been so key to having a decent democracy and functional citizenship. And the way that that's been imperiled by all this privatization and defunding, I think we have really strong issues to make that can bring broad coalitions together. So I think it's vital to defend public institutions in their integral role. And let's think about the teacher strikes most recently in West Virginia, Colorado, Arizona, North Carolina, Kentucky, right to work states in many cases, places where people said, you can't do this sort of stuff, you can't strike, it's illegal, you're gonna lose. And they didn't lose, they won. Uh, and so, and making broad arguments about that bring in parents and, uh, and, and other unions in a broader community around a defense of public institutions and public education, raising fundamental questions not only about funding but educational access and racial and gender justice. And I think while K through 12 has been a focus of this, focus of this I think higher ed also could be integral. Uh, education unions, I think, really can help build strong, broad, cross-class intersectional movements. So I think education uh, and education unions are going to be a real part of building this broader, um, you know, and re resurgent labor movement. Um, I just want to note some of the challenges you face in grad unionism and give them a nod to just how you've dealt with them because you have this membership that does turn over, that changes. I'll, I'll never forget, years ago, I first encountered this. I had a friend I came up with in the union movement who went on to work for the NFL Players Association. He had been an athlete and he, he, was a play, he worked for the Players Association. He said, you know, the biggest problem we face is my player reps turn over every three or four years because football careers are short and owners will cut players that are militant union activists, it's hard to maintain. And you all have had some version of that or have some version of that. And I, I have to say personally, and maybe Sarah would probably echo this, my colleague, we get to know some of y'all and then you're gone. It's hard. Uh, we, we really, I can think of just so many people I've really come to love and adore, but then they go away. Okay, but it's, it, I mean, it happens, but, but you've had to deal with this, and I think that's something, you know, in terms of thinking about the casualization of labor, the mobility of labor, what, you know, the precariat, you know, all of those things. You all have been dealing with that long before the rest of the labor movement did, and I salute you in terms of developing leaders and activists and understanding that the luxury of complacency you can't afford and you also have really engaged in continuous organizing. I mean, I think that's really the key to all of this for all of us, you all, but you've shown us the way. In a post-Janus world, we have to constantly be thinking about what it means to cultivate loyalty and attachment. 
And that's not an easy question, but it's really one of the most important that our movement faces. You set an example, and I think you can share your best practices with the rest of us and help all of us learn. I also think there's a critical role for grad unions. Mike and I were talking about this a little bit beforehand, and I kind of threw this out as a question, because I was wondering, I was, I was inferring that a fair amount of you who are grad students, being in a union in graduate school might be either your first union experience or your first extended union experience. Yeah, probably, you know, and again, just as our union movement has shrunk, regrettably, back in the day, I used to know folks, you'd meet them, you know, well, I learned about unionism at my kitchen table, you know, my mother was a teacher, my dad was a bricklayer or whatever. We don't get as much intravenous unionism anymore, regrettably. But I think graduate school is a great place where people can be socialized into the culture of the union movement. And I was sharing with Mike before the meeting, when I was a union organizer, I often would have what I would call the oh shit moment in a union organizing drive. And that was, you'd be on a house visit or in a meeting, and I know some of you may share this as well, somebody would say, I was a member of a union once. Yeah, oh shit, <laughs> because it's, oh God, I hope they had a good experience. <laughs> and you know, you can explain that, you can get by it, but it's a little bit like the folks who their first encounter with government is they go to the division of motor vehicles. And you know, oh, government sucks. Or you know, your first love affair went, went bad. Oh, love bites, you know. You can overcome all those things, but for you all, people having a positive union experience, which I think you really give people in all seriousness, socializing them into the culture of our movement is a really, really important task. So I wanna take my non-existent hat off to you in this case and just salute you for doing that. I think it's enormously important. And I also think that graduate students go out and take this experience as much as we hate to lose you you take it out into the larger world, whatever you end up doing. Uh, I know I have colleagues at Lurk, Sarah Laslett, Gordon Lafer, who are veterans of graduate school organizing. When I came to the University of Oregon, I was delighted to find a former colleague from uh, Grad, the grad, grad grind days, Gina Saki, she teaches romance studies. She was head of our finance committee. Gina was one of the key leaders in forming our faculty union here at the U of O. So the union spirit travels and lives on. And I think that's part of the really great work that you do is creating Johnny Appleseeds or ambassadors, you know, that will sprinkle the union dust everywhere they go. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm really you know, pleased with that. I think that's an experience that's been replicated multiple times over. A um, couple other things. Um, I also uh, want to salute you. I think graduate students often serve as a conscience or a prod, uh, I may smiling, <laughs> for, uh, for our union movement. And I really want to, again, take my hat off to that as well. I think you tend to be younger than a lot of the rest of the labor movement and maybe more political. I mean, bringing a broader political awareness or consciousness. You all are part of the world of ideas. You think a lot about ideas, big ideas, structural ideas, systemic ideas, and you've brought that awareness and that urgency to AFT Oregon and to the rest of our union movement. You've pressed us to be bolder, to be more ambitious, to take more risks. And that can be hard sometimes, at least from the, for us, some of us oldsters. Uh, but it's important that you do that, and I appreciate that. I think most of us do. Uh, at the same time, I understand that you can sometimes have an attitude of impatience or disappointment with unions, uh, which I think is understandable. And I guess I would only ask to keep on, keep it on, keep us on our toes, but also roll up your sleeves and let's do the work. And let's focus on doing that work, but not somehow to balance that sense of urgency with some measure of patience that this is a movement that does take time to change. But I will say it's changed. I mean, I think when you think of things like racial justice, gender justice, the union movement, immigration, that the union movement, it's taken a long time, but it certainly is farther along than it was five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Bargaining for the common good, environmentalism, there's a lot of things, and I guess I would just say this, that. 40 years into this work for all its faults, I think any social change that's gonna come in this country, the union movement has gotta be an integral part of that. And I appreciate you prodding us to be better. 
uh, and, and, but it's, it's uh, I think, a really fruitful and necessary interchange. And also, I would just encourage you, you've done this, but just to pursue your relationships with the rest of the union movement, uh, to work with our labor chapters and labor councils, with other unions on campus, uh, to really make solidarity not just a rhetorical term, but something that we actually practice. What you did in the 2014 strike was to show us that. And also the last thing in terms of conscience is I really appreciate your role and would encourage you to continue being a conscience regarding the role of the university. Protecting it as a space for critical thinking, uh, for the quality of a stu the student educational experience, calling us to the broader social responsibilities of the academy, asking the hard questions and continuing to engage. You have and will continue to play a major role in fighting for the kind of university we deserve. Um, finally, I just want to speak a little bit about a broader social perspective and the notion of bargaining for the, for the common or the public good. Graduate student unionism, as all unionism, is certainly rooted in the immediate needs of workers, and as it should be, but there's also that powerful slogan from education unions, our working conditions are student learning conditions. Right, that what's good for us as workers is good for students, it's good for educational institutions, it's good for the broad, broader community. So bargaining for the common good, as you may know, is an explicit effort, particularly in the public sector, to create what a uh, couple people I wrote about in my Total Person Unionism book called the Community Bargaining Table. That the idea is that yes, we bargain within these boundaries, but we can extend those and make it about bigger and broader things. Thinking about workers as total persons, you know, that you work for a period of time, but you live in a community, and those interests are not detached, they're actually connected. And using the power and leverage that we have to press for broader changes that help workers in their communities. Um, Sudi Bata Chiria, a political science doctoral candidate at Rutgers recently was quoted and I think very eloquently on this subject. And Sudeep said, the union has pushed economic issues so that people can lead a decent life, but also went on to say, our union looks beyond what we need at Rutgers to look at the wider picture of what society needs. We address the harm that is being done to poor and working class students, the harm to our environment, the harm caused by things like the Muslim ban and attacks on undocumented students. And that's the type of thing I think that bargaining for the public good and having that wider perspective can do. I know you've been active and we, you need, we need to continue to be active on issues such as student debt, funding, educational equity, support and solidarity with DREAMers and DACA students, climate change and environmental concerns. I think you are uniquely well positioned to argue on behalf of bargaining for the common good to try to implement some of those practices and support others when they're doing them. So let me just simply say this, uh, uh, conclude on a couple of notes. Um, I saw a quote recently in doing some research for this from a, a PhD candidate in rhetoric at Texas Women's University named Justin Cook. And Justin Cook said they're trying to organize a union and said, we're not trying to burn the place down, but we want to remind the university that we're people. And I think this is the type of view that has animated the GTFF and graduate unionism throughout their history, an, insistent that gradu an insistence that graduate students be treated as people, an insistence that their labor has value that should be recognized, and a belief in the indispensable role of a strong labor movement and a willingness to walk the walk on behalf of that conviction. So let me close, as I said at the beginning, happy 40th anniversary, GTFF. You've done a lot, and I think the best is yet to come. Thank you. Yeah, do we have, if you, yeah, I'm glad to, any, any comments or questions, we have some time, yeah, I don't want to cut in, yeah, sure, cut into anything else, but I'm glad any comments or questions people have to, uh, yeah, to, to talk. Okay. Yes, Sarah. <laughs> uh, hey, everybody. Um, I'm Sarah Lashford, I work with Bob at the work. Um, I want to make a comment and then also ask for your impressions or anybody else in the room. So you, your point you make about attrition and turnover amongst the grad student population, um, is a really important one and, and the way in which you have to constantly reinvent yourselves. Um, it's not on. It's not on. <laughs> is it on now? <laughs>
So yeah, so that, that need, that attrition, that turnover, the need to reinvent yourselves. You know, it occurs to me also as I'm hearing Bob talk that there's actually maybe a silver lining to that as well. Because I think one of the things that can often weigh down our unions is that entrenchment, is the lack of change over in leadership. And so I think that's also a, a lesson that graduate student unions can bring to the rest of the movement uh, about revitalization, uh, about institutional memory, events like this, where you're passing it on. You know, you're reaching back, you're reaching forward. It's a really, it's really a very sort of vitalizing, I think, practice that the movement could learn for, from more generally. And <clears throat> so that's my comment. I don't know if you want to say anything more about that. My question actually does have to do with the changing demographic populations. Um, of students, both undergraduate and graduate, and particularly from my grad student organizing days, um, the particular vulnerabilities of international students. Um, I want to elevate that and you know, ask us to think about how do models about organizing international graduate students also teach us about organizing immigrant workers throughout the economy? Um, and what do we need to be thinking about about that? How do we elevate those voices and experiences? So it's not, you know, I would love to hear anybody's thoughts on that. I don't have any particular answer to it. Uh, but Bob, I don't know if you have quest uh, comments or other people. No, I'd be happy to open that. Thank you, Sarah, I'd, and agree with, just to say that I think, I absolutely agree with you about the complacency point. I would just say from my experience in private sector unions that Dues checkoff was one of the b blessings and the curses, you know, for private sector unionism. Just this sense of guaranteed dues coming in, you know, people just checked it off. It really did lend itself to a service kind of insurance unionism. And I will say, when I did work in right to work states for my union, those were some of the most kick ass unions I'd ever met because they really had to prove it every day. So I, I think this point of continuous organizing is well taken. And yes, I think you're absolutely right about changing demographics, international students other vulnerable students, and I know that some of that work has gone on. I know great work has gone on here around Dreamers and DACA students in particular, but I think that needs to be thought about and extended more broadly, and I would certainly open it up to other people's comments on, on that as well. Uh, I just wanted to speak to how we specifically addressed international students during the strike, because that was a big concern of, of, a, of that chunk of our uh, membership. And so one of the things we did before we went on strike was we hired a lawyer to give uh, information and advice specifically for international students. We had specific meetings um, in their uh, areas of campus to talk to them about what their rights were. We reached out to the faculty, when, not the, fa well, the faculty in those areas, but also the administration once they start started sending out illegal emails and telling the international students they could have their work visas revoked if they went on strike, which is against the law. Um, and so it was one of the things that we, we were proactive and very reactive um, throughout the whole process for them and made them feel that th we were as much there for them as for anyone else and that they were not getting, they were not being put at a special risk. And so that was one of the things that you, we, we did and you can do in that kind of a situation for your international students. Oh yes, yeah, sorry, uh, if you missed me earlier, I'm Shauna. I was on the bargaining team and um, was the VP of grievances during the strike, so that was all I did was deal with that. Um, so we threatened to take them to the Oregon State Labor Board and then they retracted those emails. Oh yeah, and in our next contract, we got specific language around like how they could communicate with us um, and that they weren't allowed to do those kinds of things. So even though that's the law, it's also nice to get it re reinforced in your contract, so. Michael S. Anand. Uh, thanks, I'm Michael Marshman, the current staff organizer for the GTFF. Um, I wanted to sort of follow up on Sarah, your point and Bob's point. I came out, um, I got my start in the labor movement in a grad union in Iowa, at the University of Iowa, um, that was right to work state. And we were also organized under United Electrical Workers, which is a very strong, militant, radical union. And I didn't know any other kind of labor organizing other than constant 24 seven, 12 months a year organizing. So when I got the job here at Oregon, it was a, like a really an interesting moment for me where I thought, we have money. 
<laughs> because at Iowa, we were like, oh, gosh, you're making 15 copies, you know? Could you make that 12? Like, we were like, like money was tight. Um, and it, it was really interesting to witness the both the blessing and the curse of that resource because as Mike has mentioned earlier, between our insurance that that we have that people walk into our office to get that's excellent. Everybody knows your insurance is because of your union, and, but that and the fact that there was only a small difference between fair share and full member dues meant it was really very easy to get people to join. And I think there's been ups and downs in the history of the GTFF in terms of how active it's been in like really reaching out and recruiting people. But I remember being excited about the resource and the money. I thought, finally, get to work in a in a fair share state. And then but then quickly kind of realized, like, OK, wait, that means we have to like from my mind, like we got to kind of rebuild, re we have to alter the culture of our organizing kind of significantly. And that was even, I mean, the, that was when the Friedrichs case was coming down and it looked like that might happen. And then we dodged that bullet. But the writing was on the wall that this was was coming. And so I, I don't, I'm not grateful that we have, uh, that we're now right to work. But at the same time, I'm really appreciative of having had that experience coming into this job because I just learned that that's what you do to organize effectively. And I think we've like the the last few years have allowed us in, in fact forced us as a union to really as Mike says like go back to basics to get serious about not just talking to people but building like a community of people that care for each other understand each other right and are involved directly in making all of the decisions that we do and realizing that that only comes from hard the hard work of talking to people talking to people talking to people and tracking all of that information so we can know who have we talked to who have we reached who have we not reached yet where do we have to go to get more energy so i think there's something there's something to this moment right now which is both awful and mm -hmm. um potential there's tremendous potential right now because i feel like in my short time at the gtff we are just invigorated and vitalized and uh is that a word vitalized Okay, uh, and I think a lot of that. Front of it. A lot of that, yes. A lot of that has to do with you know the threat that we were facing and the like. We got to get real moment that we can survive here in the future. Yeah. We might have time for one more question or comment for Bob. Uh, yeah, from the other Bob. For Bill. It's actually. Thank you, Mike. It's actually, uh, thank you, Bob. It was a wonderful talk uh, and setting the context in, in, a, in a total historical uh, perspective. Uh, and it um, prompted me to think, you mentioned Wisconsin, and we are celebrating 40 years of the first contract of the GTFF today. Uh, and the GTFF 43rd actual anniversary, it's founded in 1975, uh, as the T-shirts indicate, <laughs> uh, and uh, we have, uh, and you know him well, uh, Bob Ginsburg here from Wisconsin. I just wonder if, with uh, he has, if we have a minute or two to have him make some comments, not only about that period, but perhaps uh, share some experiences about what na will happen now in Wisconsin and elsewhere when people like Scott Walker have been uh, repudiated. I wonder if that's possible. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I think you know. Just give me a, th a second to think about actually what I would what I'd say. Um, one of the challenges that 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 graduate employee unions have, and Bob talked about it, is the turnover. But it's also in the changing political climate. Uh, in Wisconsin, in particular, the the T union started in the came out of much of the, the, the anti-war activism and student activism of the, the, the 60s and early 70s. Um, and it had a much broader focus and talked about education. And uh, there's a lot of issues now that weren't issues back then. Uh, and then there was the politics changed. And it faced a, a hostile legislature, which actually changed the law to mean they couldn't have a contract. Uh, and then they had to go and work uh, in 
what's a step below a right to work state. I'm not sure what that is, but uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, but I think the, you know, and the, so they had to or change how they organize and how to get people invested. I was having lunch with Bob and, and Sarah, and too often unions were satisfied saying, what can the union do for you? When in fact, uh, unions like GTFF and TA in its best years uh, were getting people to say, what can we do to help, but, uh, to help our work uh, environment and with the jobs that we do? Uh, and it's not somebody else. And that's where the and in a right to work, uh, you know, it's going to change. And whether, you know, things may cha have changed now. Who knows what they'll be in 10 years, and in 40 years, I will hopefully not be around to to find out what it looks like. But I think the point is for these unions to be as broad and to organize in that way, and it's the those that have that history of looking and you know, I think it goes back to the TA union where they can pull on that and that history and say, how are they doing things differently? And getting people to invest in those unions and think beyond their own job. I mean, I talked earlier today about you know, what the unions do is get you to understand what happens. You know, there's other people who have similar interests beyond your own little narrow world. And we're in a world now where there's more and more encouragement for that kind of individuality. You're, it's just you and there's all these others. And I think you know, we have, that's what these kinds of unions do. Uh, and that's why these, kinds, you know, these graduate employee unions, whether it's the TA union, GTFF, people then get the idea, oh, we can do other things. And that's why you have so many people around the country who say, oh, yeah, I was in the TA union, or I was in the GTFF, or I was in GEO, or I was in whatever else, because they learn how to do that. And they're better, even if they stay in their own uh, academic discipline, they actually learn how to do other things. Harry talked about that. And that's what I got out of you know, the TA Union in Madison, uh, as well as skills. I mean, the, I learned how to bargain. And, you know, and through the tedium, who was mentioned earlier this morning. Uh, but it's also, the, they are, and, and, you know, and it's like anything else. The more you do it, the better you get at it. Same with organizing. Uh, so I think that's the that's those that lesson, and for all that you get from Madison. I just say one of my shorthands for all of this is that there's a distinction between people talking about the union and our union, and the more we have people that are saying our union versus the union, we've done something really important. And I think I, I suspect that our adjective is one that you hear, you know, often enough here because you found ways to get that sense of loyalty and attachment going. But I think that's one of the big challenges for our movement, <laughs> you know, is to get, get us to go from the to our is the modifying energy of the union. Thanks, Bob. Sure, thank you.